Welcome back to CoreM, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Brian Gilberti, and today we're joined by a very special guest, my colleague and a friend, Dr. Jonathan Kobels, who's Assistant Professor in Emergency Medicine and Co-Editor-in-Chief at CoreM. Together, we're going to unravel the complex world of cardiac arrhythmias, focusing on atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Jonathan, it's great to have you back in the studio. Thanks for having me. So I'm glad that you're back so we can delve into the intricate topic of AFib with RVR. And this is a hefty topic that we aim to split up into different categories of rapid AFib. So our general rapid AFib, rapid AFib with pre-excitation, and patients in chronic, permanent AFib presenting with rapid ventricular response in the setting of critical illness. So with that, Jonathan, kick us off with some pearls and common pitfalls for rapid AFib. When most people think about AFib with RVR, especially patients who demonstrate hemodynamic instability, we are immediately jumping to our ACLS algorithms that make this distinction between the unstable patient who should undergo immediate synchronized cardioversion and the stable patient in whom a more nuanced approach to a rate versus rhythm strategy is appropriate. I find that while this thinking applies to the patient who presents with nuance AFib with RVR, where the AFib itself is the primary etiology of hemodynamic instability, this is the appropriate approach. This algorithm fails, however, in certain patient populations presenting with hemodynamic instability in the setting of critical illness in whom AFib is chronic and the RVR is a result of the underlying pathology as opposed to a primary arrhythmia. These patients are much more likely to fail conventional ACLS algorithms as their AFib and RVR are secondary symptoms of a more pertinent underlying condition. In addition to being resistant to electrical cardioversion, these patients are also much more likely to be harmed by typical AFib pharmacologic treatments. I think we have all seen the septic patient in AFib with RVR whose tachycardia is being driven by their infection, and treating the AFib with AV nodal blockers such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers results in taking away their compensatory tachycardia and worsens the overall clinical picture. My goal for this episode is to review the ACLS guidelines for acute primary AFib with RVR, but also to develop a more thoughtful approach to patients presenting with AFib in whom you suspect critical illness. With that, Brian, can you kick us off on a review of what current ACLS guidelines have to say regarding the management of primary AFib with RVR? Yes, certainly, Jonathan. And not all AFib with RVRs are going to be the same. And ACLS is not a one-size-fits-all approach when treating the broad category of this arrhythmia. To establish the starting point, let's talk about ACLS tachycardia with a pulse approach. We've all been through the training, so I don't want to make everyone relive it. But the first question is, stable or not? If not, we cardiovert, and that's going to be a synchronized cardioversion with 200 joules for adults. If the patient is stable, then we go down the narrow versus wide QRS pathway, and it's the recommendation of rate control with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers that deserves some discussion because, like you implied, this is blind to the underlying cause or chronicity of the arrhythmia. Now, for the approach, the first thing is to identify it. ECG findings of AFib with RVR typically include an irregularly irregular rhythm with no discernible P waves and a ventricular rate of over 100. The QRS complexes are usually narrow unless there is a pre-existing bundle branch block or concurrent ventricular rate-related aberrancy. One important thing to look out for when we review these ECGs is if there are signs of a shortened PR or slurred QRS. If that's the case, then we have to think about WPW, which has a different management. So Jonathan, let's take a quick detour and talk about AFib with pre-excitation like WPW. Why is it so important to spot these and how you approach them? WPW is a special population that we should always be on the lookout for when patients present an AFib with RVR. For patients not already known to have underlying WPW, a prolonged QRS may be the only clue of an underlying accessory conduction pathway. Additionally, Consider WPW in those patients who presents an extreme tachycardia, with rates greater than 200. It's important to recognize WPW as typical first-line treatments for AFib with RVR, including AV nodal blockers, which include calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and even digoxin and adenosine, may cause atrial signals to be preferentially conducted through the accessory pathway, which will result in rapid ventricular rates and hemodynamic collapse. When stable, reach for procainamide or amiodarone. Of course, unstable patients should be treated with synchronized electrical cardioversion. Okay, taking a step back, we have the EKG out of the way and the importance of spotting AFib with pre-excitation. Let's touch on workup for these patients and the general approach to AFib with RVR in a stable patient. The thread running through this episode is going to be that care is nuanced and should take into consideration underlying pathology, chronicity, and comorbidities. In general, if a patient comes in with nuanced AFib and they are an RVR, 
Basic labs including lights, but also TFTs, calcium, magnesium are going to start our workup for these patients. For the ones that are in simple, rapid AFib and we do not suspect something else afoot, say they just missed their normal rate control medications, then the mainstays of treatment are going to be metoprolol or diltiazem. And it's an old argument that still persists on which agent is preferred, with the argument for metoprolol being blunting effects of the sympathetic surge on the heart. Some patients with CAD and heart failure are already on these medications because they're viewed as cardioprotective. And some things that make it less attractive is that it can take longer to rate control with metoprolol, and beta blockers should be avoided in patients with asthma or COPD. Now, the enantiomer of this statement is that diltiazem works faster and is an option in asthma and COPD patients. So those are going to be our general first-line agents, and there's also some debate on the best target, but 110 or less is likely to be as good as 80 or less for a heart rate goal. A final point here, rate control is important, and one thing to be concerned about is RVR, that if it goes unchecked, that this could lead to tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. Now, this doesn't happen over minutes, it doesn't happen over hours, but rather a day or so. So I only bring that up because it's important when we approach these patients to not be too aggressive when we hone in on our heart rate target. Okay, now, Jonathan, with that out of the way, talk to us about your approach with your stable, straightforward AFib with RVR. Just like you suggest, I'm first asking myself if the patient has another reason to benefit or be harmed from either a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. It's important to realize that the medication we choose in the ED often becomes the chronic daily medication for the patient and they may be taking this medicine for years or even the rest of their lives. When there is not a compelling reason for one over the other, the data would suggest that calcium channel blockers might have the slight edge over beta blockers in effectively right controlling AFib. However, that difference is minimal. When reaching for metoprolol, I am typically giving doses of 5 mg every 10 to 15 minutes, up to 3 doses, to a maximum of 15 mg. When starting with diltiazem, Guidelines recommend a 0.25 mg per kg dose, typically about 20 mg in the average adult, and subsequent dosing at 0.35 mg per kg if the first dose is ineffective. If I have any concern about a patient's ability to tolerate a calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, I might start with half the starting dose. Okay, and your thoughts on the safety of switching from diltiazem to metoprolol or vice versa when the first medication does not provide an adequate response? I think the majority of ED docs are taught that in theory this combination may produce potentially dangerous effects. In practice, I often find that cardiology will recommend trialing the other class when the first fails, and most patients tolerate this approach without any issues. With that said, once I'm at this stage in my algorithm, it is probably best to be making decisions in conjunction with cardiology. Now, this is a good checkpoint in the episode. We just covered general management of AFib with RVR and AFib with RVR with pre-excitation. Now, let's talk about AFib with RVR in the setting of critical illness. And before we dive in, talk to us about the points of pathophysiology behind the process, specifically the factors affecting cardiac output. Cardiac output is going to equal the heart rate times the stroke volume. And stroke volume is going to be determined by the contractility and preload, which work to increase stroke volume, and afterload, which decreases stroke volume. From this relationship, we can see the importance of heart rate, contractility, and preload directly affecting cardiac output while afterload and systemic vascular resistance decrease the cardiac output. The relevance is that for patients presenting in RVR, the heart rate may be compensatory to maintaining cardiac output, as one of the other variables is negatively affected by an underlying condition. Consider myocardial infarction or myocarditis affecting contractility, or dehydration or an underlying GI bleed decreasing cardiac preload. One must always be actively searching for the possibility of a secondary compensatory tachycardia, especially in patients with chronic permanent AFib. Okay, and give us some insight into how you approach these patients. Over the years, I have developed a mnemonic to systematically consider emergent etiologies of tachycardia that may be harmed by the administration of an AV nodal blocking agent. And this mnemonic is called TACHIES, T-A-C-H-I-E-S. These include thyroid toxicosis, alcohol withdrawal, cardiac etiologies including coronary ischemia, carditis with tamponade, and congestive heart failure, hemorrhage, including GI bleed, especially given that most of these patients are already on anticoagulation. I stands for intervals as a reminder to remember that in patients with a prolonged QRS, consider WPW. E for embolus, especially on patients not currently on anticoagulation. And lastly, sepsis, which is probably the most common etiology of tachycardia in patients who you suspect RVR is secondary to another underlying process. 
Okay, and this is going to be another one of those situations where picking up an ultrasound probe will provide additional clarity when we have opaque cases and tachycardia, we note, is actually the appropriate response to alternate pathology that continues to lurk undiagnosed. When we put a probe on the chest and peek at the heart, we can get an idea of the EF, if there is a pericardial fusion, if there is any obvious valvular pathology, and also if there is sonographic evidence of an acute pulmonary embolism, such as McConnell sign or RV distension. Now, moving on to the lungs, we can gauge the patient's fluid status by looking for B lines. Of course, ultrasound will just be one component of the data we're using to diagnose what is really going on with the patient. Now, we've covered garden variety AFib, AFib with pre-excitation, critically ill AFib. Now, walk us through your approach for the patient who lives in chronic AFib and is now presenting with rapid AFib and is hemodynamically unstable. In these patients, the first question is, is the AFib itself causing the hemodynamic instability? First, at extremes of tachycardia, including heart rate greater than 150, diastolic filling may be compromised, leading to a decreased preload and therefore an insufficient cardiac output. On a similar principle, patients with underlying cardiac abnormalities, such as severe valvular disease or cardiomyopathy, are more likely to decompensate due to an acute tachycardia. Lastly, I am considering if the patient is chronic AFib, meaning atrial fibrillation is their baseline rhythm, versus paroxysmal AFib. Often, paroxysmal AFib patients are presenting with acute onset of rapid heart rate. These are patients most likely to respond well to ACLS algorithms, including electrical cardioversion for hemodynamically unstable patients. Don't forget to consider duration of AFib and stroke risk with cardioversion in your clinical decision-making for these patients. And Jonathan, tell us what makes chronic chronic and why it's important to make this distinction. Knowing if a patient is in chronic, permanent, atrial fibrillation is particularly important to management decisions as hemodynamically unstable patients who have had chronic AFib for years are less likely to respond to electrical cardioversion due to the structural remodeling that has already taken place in the atrium of the heart. Even if patients briefly cardiovert, they are very likely to slip right back into AFib and you're back where you started. When these patients are presenting with hypotension, shock, signs of pulmonary edema, or ischemic chest pain, a very careful and nuanced approach is required. Now let's delve into a more challenging aspect of the care with these patients. And specifically, Jonathan, how do we approach the management of patients presenting with tachycardia or rapid ventricular response, especially when the underlying cause isn't immediately apparent? I know it's difficult to talk about most things in medicine with broad strokes, but what are the key considerations and treatment strategies that we need to keep in mind in these medically complex situations? First off, if you identify or suspect an underlying critical etiology of tachycardia, you should be initiating targeted therapies towards that etiology. For example, the patient with fever or signs of infection, I am initiating antibiotics with fluid resuscitation. For the patient who has a history and exam findings suggestive of the subacute development of volume overload, I am initiating diuresis. If the underlying etiology is not yet clear, I start with a very careful assessment of total body fluid volume using both exam findings and ultrasound to determine if the patient might benefit from a fluid bolus, such as those with signs of hypovolemia or diuresis, if there's evidence of hypervolemia. Where things get difficult is when you are uncertain about the etiology of RVR, and it is unclear as to whether the RVR is in itself affecting the cardiac output or if the heart rate is compensatory. Truthfully, this group of patients are some of the most medically challenging patients we treat in the ED and as such require a very thoughtful approach. Fortunately, there are a few strategies I consider in this dangerous scenario. My first go-to is an amiodarone bolus followed by a drip. While these patients may be unlikely to cardiovert due to chronic underlying AFib, amiodarone results in slowing of the AV node without having to worry about having a profound effect on contractility, and therefore, this medication is less likely to cause or worsen profound hypotension. Another medication I reach for in this scenario is Esmolol. Esmolol is a titratable and very short-acting beta blocker. Therefore, you can start it at a low dose and see if gradually decreasing the heart rate improves cardiac output and blood pressure. If Esmolol worsens the clinical picture, the drip can be stopped and the medication will wear off within a few minutes. For those patients who are circling the drain, this is one of the few times I will reach for phenylephrine as a vasoconstrictor, typically given in 100 microgram doses or 1 cc of a conventional neostick. Phenylephrine provides peripheral vasoconstriction and improves systemic hypotension with the added theoretic benefits of producing a reflexive bradycardia, which slows down the heart rate. Two other medications we often hear in the conversation include digoxin and magnesium. While digoxin is a great second-line agent in patients refractory to calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, or in those patients with AFib and a poor underlying ejection fraction, the effects of digoxin can take hours to see and may not be as useful for the emergency department without specific guidance for cardiology. 
Magnesium is also thought to provide benefits. However, outside of electrolyte derangement, such as hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, its effects are likely at best synergistic to conventional AV nodal blocking agents and is unlikely to be effective monotherapy. Okay, Jonathan, we covered a lot so far. Let's round it out with some take-home points. It's crucial to differentiate between primary AFib with RVR, chronic AFib with RVR due to secondary drivers, and new onset AFib with RVR in critically ill patients, and each category requires a different treatment approach. ACLS guidelines offer a framework for treating AFib with RVR, emphasizing immediate synchronized cardioversion for unstable patients. However, these guidelines may not be as effective in patients with chronic AFib and RVR secondary to underlying critical illness. Identifying AFib on ECG is vital for the diagnosis and treatment planning. Key ECG findings are an irregularly irregular rhythm, absence of discernible P waves, and a ventricular response of over 100 beats per minute, typically. And conditions like WPW syndrome require special attention. In such cases, typical AFib treatments might exacerbate the condition, necessitating the use of alternate medications like procainamide or amiodarone. The management of AFib with RVR should consider the patient's overall health, underlying pathology, chronicity, and comorbidities. And treatment options like metoprolol and diltiazem have their own pros and cons, and their use should be tailored to the individual needs of the patient. For patients in critical condition, understanding the pathophys behind the condition is crucial, and tachycardia might be compensatory in nature, requiring a thorough investigation of the underlying causes. The mnemonic TACHIES, T-A-C-H-I-E-S, for thyrotoxicosis, alcohol withdrawal, cardiac issues, hemorrhage, intervals like WPW, embolus, and sepsis can be used to systematically evaluate and address emergent etiologies of tachycardia in critically ill patients. And finally, deciding the treatment disposition of patient, there are a lot of factors that go into it, such as hemodynamic stability, the underlying cause of AFib, the patient's comorbidities, and the feasibility of prompt outpatient follow-up. So this is going to be something that requires consideration of a lot of different factors to make sure we're doing the best for our patients. Okay, that'll do it for this episode. Jonathan, thanks again for being back in the studio and shedding some light on this complex topic. Always a pleasure to be here. Mm.